Hello everyone, this is Serious Trivia and welcome back to another one of our early game playbook videos. Uh, this guide will be covering Kong Rong. He's one of our other governors. So far we have covered Ma Teng. So today we're going to do Kong Rong. Kong Rong is our master scholar. His starting situation in the game is labeled as hard and his character specialization is a strategist. So he's going to be our weak character that has a lot of range units with him that provides support to other generals and gives debuff to enemy generals as well. His personal characteristic gives him plus 5k population growth, which will play in large part to his factional specialization, which we'll cover on a bit later, and also gives him 50% trade influence. So moving on, uh, the faction specialization is called Trade Monopoly. This is a status bar more than a resource bar because you're never going to consume Trade Monopoly. You gain this by having trade deals with other factions. And the only reward for trade monopoly is increasing trade influence, which you can see as a multiplier to trade income. So there are many ways for Koron to uh, boost his trade income, which is his main play style. The play style that the game developers give him and the one we want to feature in our guide uh, for this one, for this style of playthrough. Because recently I've been doing a lot of these early game playbook video highlighting how factions are designed to be played. And Koron's faction is to designed to be played as a pacifist, someone who makes friends with all the enemy factions, someone who relies on trade to build a big bankroll, and once you're in the late game where the other three empire seats are located, then you turn it on. Then you give up on your trade playstyle, use all the wealth you have accumulated, and start tearing the world apart. That's the strategy we're advocating here. So if we look at Trade Monopoly, uh, means we have a special form of trade agreement that's called Trade Monopoly that we can have with other factions. By doing so, it will increase our resource bar and it will give us more trade influence. Another way to increase trade influence for our faction, other than getting bonuses from reforms, is that population in commanderies will give us increasing trade influence. This is key. So because higher population will give us more trade influence, and since we want to start the game as a pacifist, what I advocate for Corum players, if you want to intend to play him the way the game is designed, is to start with very few commanderies, three to four, and you want to build tall or you want to upgrade the settlement level high so that you have a high population base and then you want to maintain good relationship with your neighbors, gain a lot of trade agreements, build up your trade influence to magnify the income you get from these trade agreements and then build yourself a nice big bankroll and then you want to switch gears in the late game and give up on all these relationship and trade agreements and build many armies that are strong very upgraded and just start tearing the enemy apart and you have the units to do that because if you look at our unique features we're given the fury of Beihai and the thunder of Jian'an these two are essentially the same unit this is the level 3 version this is the upgraded level 6 version they are the strongest range unit in the game um, I have often talked about Onyx Dragon being very very good because it has the same 250 range and you get fire arrows and high damage but these units are on a different level. So these are crossbow infantry units, so you lose out the fire utility element of the range unit, but you still have the same 250 range, and you have extremely, extremely high armor piercing damage. You will wipe out the enemy with these units, and they're really fun to play with if you enjoy range units like myself, so I definitely advocate for you to give these a try in the late game once you have level six characters. In terms of unique buildings, we have a school replacement building called the Academies of Culture. Now this plays into the fact that Kong Rong is a descendant of Confucius. So school building replacement kind of makes sense here for him. It's part of the learning and market building chain. It replaces the old school building that all factions has. And instead it provides population growth, income from all sources and public order. We'll take a look at these buildings once we get into game. And I also want to announce that tomorrow I will be coming out with a commandery guide that will be featuring Kong Rong because we're going to talk a lot about how 
the mid and late game look for Cornrone today, but we can't really show you because this is an early game guide. I will be doing a special commandery guide to showcase how you want to build Koro into a tall faction, how you want to turtle up in your early commanderies. So stay tuned for that tomorrow. Uh, that would be a sort of a sister companion guide to this guide right here. Aside from that, Koro also has one special um, assignment. This is called the Education Program. It gives increased income from commerce. Uh, it's basically another way to boost commerce income and kind of guides you to focus yourself on commerce. I think the two best income source for Cornro in the game is peasantry and commerce. Uh, they're also very complementary to each other. Um, peasantry because since you're building tall, you need a lot of food, so you can't really shy away from the peasantry buildings. And then you want to add in commerce because you have additional ways to boost commerce. Lastly, because we're a governor, uh, we're loyal to the Han, so even once we reach the rank of king, we can't become an emperor ourselves. Instead, we wait for the other three emperor C to appear, and we go out and wipe them out to win us the game. In terms of noteworthy characters, sadly Koron doesn't have any legendary characters in his faction other than himself. Uh, you do get Wang Xiu, who is a semi-unique character. He has a unique uh, background called the Righteous Hero. He's a commander. Uh, decent character. We're really going to just be putting him on assignment duty the whole game, so nothing special here. And in terms of options, uh, we're playing once again on Legendary Legendary with 40 minute battle timers. So with that said, let's jump into the game and take a look at Cornroll. Alright everyone, we are loaded up in the game and we start out with the standard mission. Uh, we have to defend against the little turbans and be wary of Yuan Shao. Our first mission is very similar to many other factions where we have to engage and defeat the enemy in front of us, which will be a yellow turban army right here. Now if we look at the land around us at the beginning of the game, we are here in a commandery called Beihai. Uh, we are at uh, near the Shandong Peninsula over here, uh, right underneath the Yellow River, kind of in the central plain region. And we are faced with many different yellow turban factions around us. We have the standard yellow turban rebellion faction here as well as Yuan Shao, uh, Huang Shao, sorry, Huang Shao, one of the three playable yellow faction, uh, yellow turban factions in the game. And we have, you know, our first mission is to defeat this army and take the city. So let's start by taking a look at what ancillary items we gain. We got the architect, uh, decent, and the mathematician. Okay. So we're going to equip these onto our army here. So we're going to give the the cunning stat character onto Koron to give the uh, range units more ammo. And we always start with a stone monkey. This is a standard item that he gets at the start of the game. And we're going to give it to Zheng Yan, who is our champion. And we're also going to give the architect to him as well, because expertise and resolve both are good combat stat to give. One gives melee evasion, one gives extra health. And we're also going to switch his weapon to the giant axe. It's not really a necessity, but I just like to do that because it gives him a little bit more damage. And we're just going to kick things off with this fight. Uh, there's no need to do diplomacy first because if you look, we're surrounded by enemies. There is no one to talk to uh, other than enemies. We can confirm that in here. The only people we know on the map are Dong Zhuo and his vassal, the Han Empire, and Huang Shao and the Yellow Turban Rebellion. That's it. So no one to talk to. So let's kick things off by fighting this battle. And because we don't need to save our manpower, I'm going to save time and not fight these. Obviously, you can jump in here and use your generals to fight this one for an easy win. We're just going to delegate here. Alright, quick win. We're going to go for ransom. And then we pick up our next mission, which is to take the livestock farm back away from the yellow turbans. We'll gladly do that. Uh, once again, just gonna delegate again here. And we finish that mission as well. So that will launch our uh, standard third mission, Your Economy Grows. But sadly here for Koron's faction, we're not going to take full advantage of this. Normally I have always advocated for 
this to be fully uh, embraced rushing buildings trying to get as much of this discount out of this uh, reward as possible but in the case of Kongrong's faction what happens is that Kongrong will face a lot of early game yellow turban threat so you're gonna need a very strong early game army uh, so because of that we need to save all our money uh, to build up that first powerful army so what we're going to do instead is just going to be building tax collection buildings uh, that way we have free income and this is one of the playstyle focus you want to do in the early game so although i say this playstyle the goal of this uh, playthrough that we're trying to feature is to gain control of taishan beihai and donglai these three commanderies and build them tall and eventually include dong as well uh, you want to grab dong a bit in the mid game but in early on, you want to grab these three commanderies. You want to build tall in these commanderies. But before, uh, the goal to build tall is obviously to build up our population. Because as you can see here, uh, there is the trade influence bonus, which is not available to all other factions based on how much population you have in the commandery. It goes up to 45% per commandery. Uh, this is our way to build up wealth. We're not trying to build up wealth by, uh, you know, conquering a lot of land and building them up. We're trying to make a lot of friends and make a lot of trade routes. That way we can uh, magnify the reward we get from the trade route by having a high population and having a high trade influence. So that's our goal. But before we can get there, the way we can supplement our early game income is by having a bad public order. So early game, we're going to sacrifice our population growth for bad public order. Uh, because we're going to have a high level of uh, the tax collection building and we're going to farm those yellow turban rebellions that spawn up for gold experience and ancillary items which we can in turn use in diplomatic ways to gain land away from our neighbors namely Liu Bei and whoever comes out winning in the north um, because we want to maintain friends we don't want to actually conquer them in battle we want to win land over diplomatically uh, there's another reason for this, because if you look at our trade monopoly resource bar here, there's a penalty here where it says every army reduces faction wide trade influence by 35%. Means we can, the more army we have on the field, the less money we make from trade. So we want to have just one army on the field uh, in the beginning to the mid game. Once we decide to turn things on and go out for our world conquest, we're going to give up on most of our trade routes because we're going to be turning our trade allies into enemies and then we can spawn multiple armies and spend the monies we've been saving so think of cornwall as a transition you know early game transition to sacrificing population to farm yellow turbans which will shift into high population high trade influence high trade income which will then dip back once again to no trade agreement, multiple armies, you don't care about trade influence, and then conquering the world. So it's kind of this ebb and flow strategy with Cornwall. So once at this point, uh, the reason why we just delegated everything is because we're gonna get rid of everyone. We're gonna try to save money here. We're gonna recall everyone because everyone's also very injured. And we don't need everyone out on the field. Especially Wang Xiu. Wang Xiu is going to go on permanent uh, assignment duty. And we're going to recall and then redeploy Kongrong and the champion very next turn. So we do have assignment slot available. Right now we have two characters. Uh, this will boost commerce. And this is the special assignment that everyone has, which will also boost commerce. Uh, Sun Shao here. Uh, he does have supervised construction. He's a sentinel. But we're going to get rid of him because he's quite pricey as a character and we're going to get a very good sentinel named Tai Shi Tzu very soon in this playthrough. And he's also weak, um, nothing to stand out about him. And his salary is a bit high so we're going to go to our court screen and we're just going to straight up fire him. Oh wait, in the court screen, yeah, there we go, we don't want to marry him. Alright, now we trim down our size, we have 1,828 gold per turn. We can move on to turn number two. All right, so turn number two, uh, we can pop Wang Xiu into the assignment slot. We want him to do tax collection so that we can get some income from peasantry, which is what Beihai will focus on in the early game, as we'll have a land development and a tax collector here. Um, we see that 
Liu Bei has completed his first、uh, turn. He has land. He borders us, so we can talk to him and secure ourselves a trade deal. So you see here, we have the standard trade agreement and this new trade monopoly. Make sure when you negotiate trade deals with other factions of Koron that you always go with trade monopoly.、Uh, the value that you see here usually would be the same. I haven't seen a case where they're different.、Uh, just don't misclick because trade monopoly will give you a resource in terms of your faction special resource bar. Trade agreement would not give you that. So we wanted to get trade monopoly. Liu Bei is very nice with us. Liu Bei would not take consideration of your military strength. So in this case, we don't have to ever worry about the size of our army. It will always be 3.6 based on his opinion on the idea and trade worth. So that's why we kind of liberally delegated our first two battles because it doesn't really make a difference in our gameplay.、Uh, we're gonna request him to pay us for this.、Um, he doesn't start out with much money, sadly. So we're probably only gonna get maybe like a hundred and one from him. Is my guess. Yep, which is perfect. All right, so we're gonna leave Liu Bei alone.、Uh, many players complain that Liu Bei will landlock you by taking Longya and the lumberyard and the fishing port. That's fine.、Uh, like I said, he will definitely take Longya. You can't stop him. There's no way、uh, he would he would just unify this. You can't rush there and take this small city. There's just you don't have the force to do it. So let him have it, and once he has this commander capital, the value of these counties become much less to you. So you can just let him have these as well.、Uh, you're more interested in getting Donglai for the food, and Donglai also has a harbor building, so it's actually worth quite a bit in terms of food production and also in terms of commerce and peasantry income.、Uh, Taishan is your main focus early on because capturing all of Taishan would actually trigger one of your first early game event, dealing with yellow turbans. We'll get there when we talk about that.、Um, some characters available. Guan Chun,、uh, not really interested. We're once again on the lookout for、uh, characters with unique background. Let's say a farmer is very good, or you're looking for legendary characters. We also gained an Anzuri item, land shipper,、uh, shaper.、Uh, pretty good. We can give it to the character that doesn't have the item right now. And what we're gonna do this turn is raise the army. We're gonna put these guys back on the field, fully healed. And instead of Wang Xiu, who is now on assignment, we're gonna take out our third uh, general, uh, fourth general technically,、uh, Shi Yi. Gonna get rid of his archers because we're not gonna recruit for a few turns, so we're gonna save our upkeep money.、Uh, there's some disagreement between these two, but don't worry, we'll resolve everything eventually. The reason why I want Shi Yi in our army is because Shi Yi has the composure skill unlocked, which gives us fire arrows and most importantly night battles, which will come in handy very soon.、Uh, Kornron on the other hand starts out with resourcefulness, which gives us flaming shot on trebuchets, which will also take advantage very soon as well. So now we have this. We have vision on Huang Shao. So there's two scenarios: one that he attack you right away、uh, at this end turn. Or that he recruits a little bit more men and attack you the next turn. Either way, you can dominate this force very easily, and I'll show you how. So we're done with everything. Let's continue. All right. So Huang Shao decides to die faster. So he just decided to attack us during the end turn.、Uh, it looks like a close defeat for us, but we're gonna jump in here. This is the loop around battle strategy.、Uh, if you've seen it before, just fast forward this part. If you haven't, I'll show you how to win this fight pretty cleanly. All right, guys. So we loaded up to our battle. If we take a look, they have lined their guys against this door. What we're gonna do is set ourselves up to run them around this、uh, commandery and wipe them out with our arrow towers without ever having to engage them. To properly do this,、uh, you want your captain unit, this guy right here, who is your slowest unit. His running speed is 34. It's slower than your other infantry, which is all 38. This is key here, because he's heavily armored. He often will get caught as you loop them around. So what you want to do in the beginning is actually put him on the opposite side, right, out of view.、Uh, this way he's out of the vision of the enemy. And then you want to start your main army. This is your bait 
you want to start them to one side, whichever side you want. Uh, in this case, we're just going to put them on this side. And we want to stack them all at the door so they can get out all at the same time. We'll call that group two. This is our bait group. This is group one. They're fast because they have horses. The enemy generals will travel with the group so they won't charge out. So you don't have to worry about getting caught. And we're going to get started like this. We're going to run our bait group this way. And we're going to run this group out this way. And we're going to run that group out this way. We want them to chase you around the commandery capital. We can do this on fast. But we don't want them to touch the edge of this town. Because yellow turban generals, you want to lure their attention. All right. And then we can start letting them chase us. Yellow turban generals uh, will burn buildings when they're on idle. They have the raider trait. So we don't want them to be right next to our commandery because we don't want them to burn down all the capital, all the towers. So we want to loop them around this way. So once we get them chasing us, we can just start guiding them around the commandery, letting them take a tour, and also letting our arrows keep hitting them. You see that trail of dead bodies already? That is basically the idea of this strategy. And we're going to have these guys go forward. Just kind of, you know, looping around. Letting them chase us and getting killed. Very, very simple strategy. Very useful when you have a commandery where it's not a small city yet. So there's no walls. But when there are walls, the enemies, you know, take a pretty smart approach to things and actually try to climb walls instead of chase you around. But when it's a town or a large town, uh, the enemy is not really there to rush in because even if you take the flag in the middle, it doesn't end the battle, right? This flag only decreases morale, it's like counties. So that's why you can um, have them chase you. And you see they're already dying. Uh, they probably can't go a full circle, probably half circle and they're all dead. I can get these guys to continue to just walk around. Mainly, you're just trying to bait them with your cavalry. Uh, when you don't have generals, this group will be your bait. They will still outrun these guys because they're the same speed, basically. Uh, but that guy can't outrun anyone, so you always have your captain unit in the front. And this is a pretty boring way to exploit the AI. They're basically chasing, you know, a carrot as our arrows shoot at them. And you see this trail of dead bodies. Oh, make sure we decline all duels. And when they're chasing like here, you don't want to turn like a tight corner, right? You don't want them to start pathing through your commandery. You want you them to chase you out beyond the edge, right? You're making basically a big square uh, outside of your commandery and letting them chase you all the way. Once they break a certain distance from this point, we can then turn. This is not even fair. Basically, we're killing them. All right, now we kind of loop back closer once they break the edge. And then they can turn like this, getting a smooth shot on our towers the whole way. Right, you also don't want them to overchase outside the ranger tower. You want to keep them dying continuously around your tower. Uh, we haven't been microing these guys. They, got, they should just keep moving. And that's it. Um, this is a very effective strategy to defend uh, towns. It's also kind of effective if you have a county now, because nowadays uh, not only are towers slightly buffed in the latest patch, uh, spear units also buffed. So spear units can now dismount enemy generals. So counties have very easy ways to destroy the enemy as well. And we just keep them running in a circle. They're already dying slowly. Uh, there's one thing. This uh, this group of Militia of Virtue will always have 100 um, morale. So they'll never route. You just have to slowly whittle them down. Alright, we're back to the starting point. You can see where their body started dying. So congratulations on finishing lap 1. Usually this is where they start to die off because there's too many arrow towers here. There's, there's an overlap of two right here. But 
they can stop running. I don't think they'll make it very far. We can actually like set them up to fight here if we want. Hmm, they're trying to go inside. Nope, come chase us. Ooh, the generals the generals are chasing after us. <laughs> Alright, you can let them run in as well. Look at them, they're already dying. Alright, alright, run after. Once they start routing, try to run after them. The goal is to kill Huang Shao once because he has resiliency. Uh, but I don't think we'll make it. They they're the same speed. So unless the arrow tower can kill them. Oh there's a chance. He has only 3k health. Let's try to manually control them. But you see they all died and we didn't really use any manpower at all. Um, I don't think we'll catch him because it's the same speed. So we're just going to claim victory here. Alrighty. So we not only won that battle, we captured a general. So with yellow turban generals, when we capture them, uh, we can't employ them. We can release them for gold, but if they're carrying any type of ancillary items, you execute them for the items. Because although you can't equip some of these items because the weapons especially, like this two-handed mace, none of your generals can equip it, but they're great for diplomacy, right? You can use this as a bronze item to any faction. So we execute and pick up income. Alright, uh, turn three. We are doing pretty good. We got a new mission to recruit two more units. Uh, we built our first building, so now we have three turns of discount. But sadly, like I said, what we're going to do is just build free buildings. Save up our gold for uh, building up a full army next turn, actually. So we got two ancillary items. And Huang Shao is no longer a threat for you. Uh, he was weakened to the point where he's never going to attack you. You can freely take these two cities uh, once you get your full army up. And then you also trigger the event where the Yellow Turban Rebellion will spawn a full stack instead of Beihai. So that's our goal. Uh, we don't have to do anything this turn. We're going for the end turn right here. Alright, so right now we have reached our first spring, which means a new reform. And this is the first time we took a look at the reform tree. And we noticed that the first free reform we got was for an envoy. So we technically started the game with two possible trade routes. And technically three because we have one additional skill that's unlocked on Kongrong that gives another one. So we don't need to go for this one right away for another trade route because we don't have enough partners in the beginning. So the one I'm going to advocate for us is this one. We're going for regional commissioner. Not because we're trying to rush the red reforms for a military route. Because the 8% recruitment cost is just the most uh, optimum choice right now, given that we want to recruit a full army. So this will drop the cost by quite a bit. So we're going to go for this one. After this, um, this reform, then we're going to consider the agricultural reform, because we're definitely needing more agricultural buildings. We're going to consider the, um, the blue reforms here for school unlock, for uh, higher level in unlock, because we're going for commerce and school buildings. And obviously going for a higher level of tax collection uh, is also a great choice in the early game because we're trying to decrease our public order as much as possible to get that rebellion spawning as quick as possible. So this is definitely also something we should consider on the next time we get a new reform. So we got that uh, reform to get discount. Let's take a look at new char characters. Uh, she could potentially be our wife, but... Um not that interested. Korong doesn't have a wife, doesn't have a family at the start of the game. So it's kind of sad, but neither of these characters are that important. So we're not really going to recruit them. Let's instead pop out a full army. So we start this round with 9,000 gold. Now we're going to spend pretty much all of it. We're going to be spending it on four archer militia for Korong and two tribuchets, which is our main fighting force. We're going to pop in four uh, spear guards and for him just six archer militias you know we bragged a lot about how strong uh, the fury of Beihai is in the early game but those units are just too pricey if you take a look at the swap cost they cost a thousand per unit and the upkeep is 160 our upkeep for archer militia is 60 uh, they're fancy unit. They they will be really strong, you know. But they're three times the cost of crossbowmen. We just don't have the economy in the early game to support these guys. 
once we have a better economy, we'll definitely upgrade all our archer militia into these. But for now, this is a decent army for you to use. And we're going to wait a turn for everyone to uh, replenish before taking on Taishan. So let's end turn here. All right, because we recruited new units, we get growing might, which is very helpful because we get replenishment rate 10%. And we need to gain momentum, which will give us more trade influence by holding more commanderies. We're going to do that very soon. I'm thinking I'm going to use one more turn to replenish uh, so that we have a decent sized army. Right now, no one's even at half health yet. Now, if we take a look at our resource bar here, we gained 15 points of trade monopoly. Basically, every trade uh, monopoly route that we secure will give us five trade uh, points per turn. And... This goes. This bar goes from zero to a five hundred. So each break is a hundred. So once we break through a hundred, nothing's happening from zero to a hundred. Once we break free it from a hundred, we get additional twenty-five percent trade influence. The minus four trade monopoly by market force is just a way to slow you down. So for example, if we have one just one trade route, we're adding five per turn, right? So we get to five hundred in a hundred turns. Now that's, that seems too simple. The game's gonna slow you down once you reach a second tier, right? You're gonna lose four of those points once you reach a second tier. So this encourages you to secure a second trade route if you want to uh, move up quicker, right? You have 10 points, it'll be six points per turn and so on. So each time you're trying to hold you back by increasing the amount of trade monopoly points that's decreasing. So at level five, the fifth tier between 400 to 500 points, you need at least four trade route to maintain this tier, right? Four trade route will be 20 points and you get additional 100% trade influence. Uh, it's not a huge reward, but just something very passive. You don't really have to think too much about this. As long as you have trade mob, please, you're gonna be moving up. So at this point, we're just gonna rest for another turn as we build up this commandery. Uh, because we still have one turn of your economy growth left, uh, I like to maximize that and upgrade the land register, the land development building. Because if you look at the cost, this is saving us the most money because it's the most expensive one, the most amount of turns. So we're getting the most out of this 20% discount if we upgrade this building. So let's go for that. And that's it. Uh, we can just end turn here. All right, so Liu Bei is going to periodically offer you a non-aggression pack. Uh, it's great because he likes you and it'll always be a positive number for you, but we're not going to rush this. He's not going to attack us in the beginning. We're going to save this as part of a diplomatic point when we want to trade Dong away from him. Right now, Dong is his capital, but once he gets Long Yat, Dong will no longer be his capital. So eventually we can trade for it once we secure the Dong commander capital for ourselves. So we're just going to reject for now. All right, so we're at harvest season. Let's see if we got any cool characters. Uh, no one great yet. That's fine. Just saves us money. But you know, there's two thousand money, uh, two thousand gold in the bank in this playstyle. So in case you get those legendary characters, you still have the money to recruit them. Uh, so now we have pretty much a ready army. We can start taking out the Taishan trade port or the town. Uh, the trade port is within range, so we're gonna go for this first. Uh, you can definitely fight it on the battlefield if you want. Uh, it'll save you manpower. You just line up the tribuches. They run out of the settlement. You bomb them and win. But to save time, I'm just going to delegate with night battle. And we only lose 70. So not bad. Let's occupy. And because we have three settlement now, we gain momentum. So slightly more trade influence means slightly more income from trade. And the new mission is to gain more trade influence. Well, actually, it's still 40 for more turns, basically. And to send some on assignment, it'll be automatically done. And we have a level up on Kongro. So there are many ways to go here. Uh, none of these are bad. Um, Precision is probably the best one because you're commanding with Kongro. So you get extra range damage on his own army and also fire rate which will help out on all these units right here. Patience is good 
because we're farming a lot of uh, yellow turban generals. So we want to capture them so that we have the option to release and execute for item. So this is obviously good. And lastly, reach is good because you have more campaign movement range. Um, all these are great. I'm going to go for precision because we're not really going to move too far away from where we're starting. So we don't really need reach right now. Uh, eventually, we'll try to get it. And patience obviously great as well. Uh, composure is not needed because we have someone with that. So we're going to go this way and then probably go down this way afterward. So we've taken control of Taishan. Uh, we could upgrade it, but we lost the bonus discount. So we're going to wait. Uh, we're going to wait for these upgrades. It's a nice 110 income per turn. Uh, eventually, we're going to put an administrator here in Taishan first and build it up. But right now, we're just going to wait. And we're going to shift our army to take this next, uh, but not this turn. So let's continue. All right, we gained more momentum. We picked up the second Marquis mission. And this is our challenge. Our challenge is to get at least trade income of a thousand. So this requires us to get more trade route. So we'll get there eventually. And this will just give us slightly bonuses for five turn. Uh, so now we're just gonna shift our army this way. We'll stay on the road. And our target next turn is to attack Taishan, which is undefended because Huang Shao is too busy fighting over here. And do we get any good characters? Uh, Yu Jin. Yu Jin is okay. Um, I don't consider him to be like game-breakingly good to recruit, so we're gonna save our money instead. And we can just end turn, because we need to hurry up and take care of Taishan to trigger the event. And Wang Xiu leveled up. He is basically gonna be our assignment character, so we're gonna go, go for this bottom row here. Alright, let's continue. All right, so Koro and Shi Yi are developing a relationship. Good for them. Uh, this character, Wang Yun, uh, he's just running away from Long Ya because Liu Bei took the commandery. He's going to Dong Lai. We don't have to worry about him. Let him run through. He's not going to attack us. So now we've got an Anzeri item. Oh, Foreman's quite nice, but don't have to worry about that. We're just going to take Taishan to town. Now, once again, you can fight this on the battlefield to reduce your losses. Very simple, just a garrison fight. We're saving time, so we're just going to delegate. Alright, let's occupy. So as we have taken over Taishan, next turn, we're going to have a full stack of uh, Yellow Turban Rebellion spawning in Beihai. The second you have control of the entirety of Taishan, that event will trigger. And that's what we want to trigger, because that event trigger will be followed by Tai Shi Ci coming to our faction. That's what we're going for. Over here, we're going to just demolish their garden and convert this to our inn. And that's it. Uh, Beihai can have another upgrade. We're going to use the money to upgrade the town now. Because we want it to be a small city so that we can upgrade this to tier 3. Let's continue. All right, so the event triggered, Yellow Turban Menace. This always triggers once you control all of Taishan. So you can delay this if you want, or you can speed this up if you want. But I think this is a good pace. So you see a full stack, and you're like scared, right? Most players, when they play Kongrong, uh, don't know to build a full army early on, because they don't know this event is coming. And when they see this army, they get super scared, because this looks like you know so many units. But to be honest, if you look at it, they're all peasants, so they have very, very low morale, right? The highest morale some of these units have is like 24, right? 24 morale. So if you trigger a night battle with them, they automatically lose 15 morale. So for some of these units that have like 17 morale, they start the battle with 2 morale. And then you use fire attack from your fire arrows and tribuchets. That's another 4 morale down from fire around them, so they automatically route. So this army is actually just a paper tiger. You know, you wipe this out super easy. Uh, but first, let's pick up a new reform. Um, because we don't have a level, uh, a small city yet, so we can't really uh, build a level 3 tax collection. So we don't need to rush this one right away. We can get this one for more trade influence and eventually a level 4 in. Or, um, I think this one's actually quite good because it gives you the plus 3 population growth. Uh, pretty decent uh, choice as well. Also a level 4 livestock farm, which we do have. So let's go this way. 
All right. And here, we're going to build a tax collection building. Uh, same strategy here. Uh, we're going for commerce and peasantry. Um, same thing here. We're just going for pure peasantry in the beginning. All right. So we're going to take our army, and we're going to crush this army right here. Now, the AI doesn't think we'll win. But we're going to fight this and show you it's so easy. All right, we loaded up into the massacre of peasants here. Uh, all we need to do is just line up our range units in the back. Uh, we can kind of look for a better terrain. I guess this is better, right? This can protect our right flank. So we can go here. Really not necessary, but might as well. And then these guys have fire arrows. We should take off the skirmish mode because we don't want them to run away. We want them to just stand and keep shooting. Doesn't matter if we take losses. Uh, although we have access to formations, these guys are just there to eat arrows. So they're just going to stand there without formations. Just a little bit of protection on the flank. He will go out and take duels. Koro and Shiyi will just sit in the back. And that's it. That's the setup we have. Let's start. Uh, we can have the tribuche start out with not firing a will because the generals will come out first and we don't want the fireballs to be smacking the generals. Uh, let's run up, pick up a duel. They don't see us. That's why it's kind of foggy in this weather. So that's why it's kind of weird that they're walking straight. All right, whoever challenges you, just take it. He, well, The goal for him is to get him low health. Don't die, but get him low health. There's a reason for it. We'll show you guys very soon. So these guys are still moving. They're just slow. Let's speed things up. We can manually fire one shot so they can see us. Right, once we fire, they see us. All right, now we can go back to... Uh, fire will all right we just sit back enjoy the view look at the look at them routing right once they see fire this night battle all of them come in with low morale and we just keep hitting them with fire now there's still a lot of men but you know you don't have to worry too much about it and over here in the duel, just keep using abilities whenever you have them. Alright, and we won over there. Uh, decline this one. Decline this one. Have him go kill some of the archers that are coming back. You see this? Is this really a threat? This peasantry group that just routing randomly, regrouping, coming back? They're just here to give you levels to your tribuche. All right, and we can chase. I'm interested in chasing archer units. Now they're going to slowly come back. You know, once they leave, uh, go away from the fire, they're going to be like, OK, we can try to charge again. And then they're going to come back and they're going to see the fire arrows and decide, OK, bad choice, bad choice. Now these generals, because Spear units that are braced now breaks horses. See, once they charge, they lose their mount. Uh, they pretty much become useless. And you can just let your spear units kill them. You can also send him in. He can debuff their armor. Just keep them here. Uh, a fast way to kill generals is just have your units keep right clicking them. Because every time you right click, they register like attack. So, um,. That's one fast way to kill them quickly. So let's just get them routing. You don't want to kill everyone off. Uh, the goal is to have this army still on the map after this turn. Because we have a, a special use for this army. Alright, so we win. Let's just take the victory. Pretty simple, right? Pretty much no loss. 
All right, so we crushed this army. It's still going to be on the map because a lot of the army retreated. And that's perfectly fine. And we capture generals, so if they have nothing of value, we just release. If they have something, we execute. And we grab the income. And we leveled up a general. Yeah, we can give him a level. Alright, so now we're going to use one of those old tricks that we uh, used to use when pre-patch. The Before the patch, when the army was on march, they can keep running away. So the old trick was you right-click them, and once you enter their circle, you backspace. Uh, we, we don't even have enough movement point. But basically what you want to do is you wanted your circle to like lock into each other so they can't run anymore. Uh, we failed to do that because we don't have enough movement points. But in that case, we just don't want them to move around too much because we still want to fight this army. Um, and that's it. Uh, we did pretty well. We definitely they don't have a chance against us. Let's continue. Alright, so they decided to suicide into our city. That's fine. Uh, kind of ruins my plan because usually I want to lock them in place so they can't do stuff like this. But we can just simply delegate this fight. And they lost. Surprise, surprise. Uh, nothing to steal, so just release. Alright, so the turn after the rebellion spawns, this event comes. Uh, tai Shi Ci, uh, war goes badly on all sides, you're beset. In your honor, hour of darkness, a warrior carrying a stout bow approaches, his hair flowing magnificently in the breeze. My lord, I'm Tai Shi Ci from Dong Lai. My mother called you a good man who treated her most generously. Therefore, I come by foot to aid you. Perhaps this Tai Shi Ci could be sent to secure alliance with Liu Bei. If not, he could certainly be put to work on the battlefield. So historically, you are beset by a large army of yellow turbans. You are losing. So Tai Shi Ci comes as a very capable warrior. So the way out obviously isn't to add one warrior. You want an army to come help you. So historically, following the story is we sent Tai Shi Ci to break out from the enemy siege. So he's capable, so he cut his way through the enemy siege to go to Pingyuan, which is where Liu Bei was at the time historically, to get Liu Bei to come with his army to help us out. So that's the story. Now in this case, we don't really need Liu Bei's help, and we already have a good relationship with Liu Bei. So why not keep Tai Shi Ci to work for us? So let's employ him instead. Alright, so we get this amazing warrior. Tai Shi Ci. He doesn't look 25, but he is 25. So he's super young. He has a nice armor. He doesn't have any items. Sometimes he comes with items. And he really needs a bow. Uh, you need to get him a bow eventually in the game. Because he has this unique ability called Quick Fire, which uh, basically is a stacking ability that builds up his range damage. So you want this to uh, use him on his bow. He also starts with this ability called Hail of Arrows. Think of this as a shotgun ability where you just basically fire arrows at the enemy units uh, in a spread and it wipes out tons of unit per usage and you can essentially kite the enemy with Tai Shi Ci and use this ability on repeat to wipe out whole armies just by himself. You don't need a bow to use this ability. You can use this ability right now. And also you have Venomous Shot, which is another uh, missile attack. This is a great enemy general killer. Uh, you can only use this three times per battle. It's ticking damage uh, over 30 seconds, but also lowers the enemy's melee evasion and melee attack rate. It's perfect for killing generals. So all in all, super great general, uh, intimidating, defiant, honorable, all decent traits. His personal background uh, also gives him plus 10 melee evasion for melee infantry if he is the Prime Minister Arrow Faction Leader, as well as plus 10 range damage. So oftentimes, I like to adopt him into the family and make him our heir. Um, he's also a great um, uh, administrator if you don't make him your heir because of his high expertise stat. So either way, he's a great character to have in your army. Uh, he's on one turn cooldown, so we can't summon him. And if you look at summoning him, he comes with a full retinue, so he's very expensive to put out on the field. And because we don't have flexibility as a skill that's on the skill tree of um, 
strategists, we can't lower the cost. So the best way to recruit him is through a suicide recruitment. So the best way to recruit him is actually have him, who is not, you know, a special general, fight a battle and die. If he dies in a battle, we can just recruit Taishi Tzu to take over his retinue, right? Oftentimes when you have a de death, you can have Taishi, some general that's freed up in your court to take over the retinue. And that's exactly what we're going to try to do. Now, obviously, we can't do it this turn because he's still on cooldown. And sadly, this army is already so weak, we can't have him die to it. Uh, if he didn't attack the city, we could have just had him die to this army. So right now, we're just going to take this army off the field. Alright, so we still want Taishi Tzu on the field. What we're going to do instead is now march down. So in this, this case, Liu Bei has been quite slow in taking these land. So we can actually cut him off, right? If we take wherever he goes, right? If he take the lumberyard, we take the fishing port. If he's taken the fishing port, we take the farmland, right? Wherever we decide to stop him, uh, we can go take it and then eventually use it as trade pieces to get other land from him or from other factions as well. So let's march down here. We don't need to worry too much about Huang Shao. Even if he comes and retake Taishan, it's totally fine. Uh, we can just take it back. Right now, the goal is to make sure Liu Bei doesn't take Donglai. That's that's the our baseline. If he takes this, he crossed the line. So let's continue. Oh, actually, we didn't take a look. Ah, good thing we take a look. Guo Jia is available. Let's recruit him. Ji uh, Ling is also a pretty famous historical general, but uh, it doesn't come with any great traits here in the game, so we're just going to ignore him. So let's continue. Now there's a, another very good reason we didn't turn west to take Dong, uh, because the second we peek out here and have vision of the north bank of the Yellow River, we're going to meet Yuan Shao. And the second he sees you, he declares war on you. It's This guy just hates us for no reason. The game just designed him that way. So we just have to avoid seeing him for a while. Um, so Dong's going to be pretty secure. Huang Shao is not going to lose it. And Huang Shao is going to be busy battling Liu Bei. And he also has a land here. So he's you know, navigating his forces here. So he's really not really going to attack us. Instead, we're going to turn our attention over here. We probably want to go on march to get there faster. We want to see where Liu Bei's men are. So Liu Bei is not in range. Uh, we can take this instead. So let's just wait till next turn to take this. Uh, we can just upgrade the free buildings. We want to turn a rebellion, right? You see here, the population is not going to grow as fast once we have very negative public order. And that's okay. Uh, we, Like we said, we're sacrificing that population growth early on uh, by farming these rebellions that's going to spawn. So let's first take Long Yat over here. Let's go next turn. So Liu Bei once again offered another non-aggression pack. We're going to wait. So we're going to reject this one. Alright, uh, other things happening around the world. Hua Xin has burned as well. Alright, so let's recruit another general. Obviously, your game's going to be a little different in terms of who comes and who not, but we have the economy for it. And now we want to switch over to normal stance and take this fight. Now, how we fight this is very key here. We want to fight it so that our generals die. That's the goal. We don't need night battle because we want the enemy to have high morale. So let's jump in here. Alrighty, so we loaded up in this fight. Um, obviously, easy fight to win. Uh, what we want to do is have our armies stand pretty far back because we want our generals to suicide. And we don't just want one general to suicide, we actually want both generals to suicide now because Guo Jia is also available. So both of these guys can go die. And let's start. Charge! And since they don't have resiliency, they're just gonna, when they die, they're just gonna die. Alright, how about you die to that group right there? You die to that group right there. 
and we can speed up their death. Alright, he died. Let's see if he can die too. He's doing really well. Oh no. Alright, so what we do in this case is just have him stand where the towers are and let him get shot to death. Because he needs to die. Alright, let's just uh, watch him die. Alright, so he didn't die because the enemy retreated before we had time to kill him. Kind of sad. But we're going to showcase summoning um, Guo Jia the same, similar way, right? You keep the old Ren Yu, you have a general sitting on the uh, court that's doing nothing. Confirm. And now Guo Jia is in the army. Uh, same idea, we're going to try again with him uh, going forward. Basically, get Tai Shizu out with this Ren Yu. Which actually works better, you know. If you look at Tai Shitz's skills, you have uh, plus five melee evasion for melee infantry. These guys are still considered melee infantry. Um, eventually, you can also upgrade their um, armor piercing damage as well as melee attack rate of himself. But basically, you want to get composure on Tai Shitz and also get uh, more range damage. So you have plus ten range armor piercing damage buff from Tai Shitz. You get the plus 10 armor piercing range buff from Guo Jia and also another plus 10 from Kong Rong. And you can also make Tai Shi Ci your uh, adopted into the family. It'll cost you 4,000 gold, but it's worth it. And then you make him your heir. So you get another boost uh, from Tai Shi Ci's um, background here, another 10% range damage. So overall, this is how you want to set up your early game. Uh, now that you cut off Liu Bei from eating into your territory, there's actually no rush to take control of these right now. What you want to turn your focus on is to start farming these uh, rebellions that's going to start to appear in your lands, especially Taishan. And then you want to build up your commanderies, build up your economy, switch out your army from Archer Militia into Fury of Beihai. And you want to level up your generals, level up your army slowly by killing off the farmed rebellions. And build up your command level till they are, you know, as high as you can to get the maximum amount of population from the trade influence, from the peasantry income boost, and then you can start making friends. You know, Huang uh, Yuan Shao is going to attack you. Just fight off his invading army, then make peace with him. Get your trade deal with people in the north and also people downriver, because once once you make peace with um, Yuan Shao, you can take control of Dong, which will give you a harbor on the river and make you have more trade deals going forward. And you can also trade away uh, with Liu Bei here. Because if you take a look real quick, we don't need it right now, but in the future, uh, he's only going to ask you very little for it. And you're going to have a lot of these farm yellow turban items. right? We already have tons of items just from fighting the yellow turbans that we have so far. And we can easily get these with food, with money. We're going to have a lot of gold. So that's how you play Conro, or at least that's the way I recommend you to play Conro. And if you think you don't have enough land to expand, you can always, you know, sail down south if you want more land. But I think having control of Donglai, Taishan, Beihai, and Dong is good enough for your uh, economy in the early game because most of your money is going to come from trade routes. And I'm going to be putting out a Conro uh, commander guide tomorrow at the same time. So check that one out to see how you can build tall with Conro, one of the few factions that you can actually do. Um, so yeah, that's our early game guide. You're pretty much set up to dominate the game as a peaceful faction, um, which is one of the rare sites in Total War Three Kingdoms. So hope you enjoy this guide, and see you next time. Bye!